My name's Lawrence Cram. I'm the Acting Vice-Chancellor of the University. In the spirit of reconciliation, the Australian National University recognises that it's situated on country for which the Ngunnawal people have been custodians for many centuries and on which they've performed age-old ceremonies of celebration, initiation and renewal. We acknowledge their living culture and unique role in the life of this region and offer them deep appreciation for their contribution to and support of our academic enterprise. Mr Nwanzi, President of the International Fund for Agricultural Development. Mr Thomas Elhout, Director of the Asia-Pacific Region of IFAD. Ron Hartman, members of the Diplomatic Corps, faculty of the ANU and students of the ANU and distinguished guests. It's a great pleasure to welcome you to this event this afternoon to discuss the latest Rural Poverty Report of the International Fund for Agricultural Development. In Asia, 70% of the poor live in rural areas. Although every region of Asia has made significant progress in reduction of rural poverty in the last decade, the problem remains acute. And over the last few years, the problem's been exacerbated due to what we might call the triple F, problems with food, problems with fuel, and problems with the financial crisis in the world. And this is making the task of meeting the Millennium De Development Goals of the UN, halving extreme poverty by 2015, more challenging. Indeed, I would say impossible. IFAD's Rural Poverty Report attempts to address the general problem of poverty and vulnerability in the Asia-Pacific region, as well as to make an impact on the way that the triple F problems might be dealt with. The report concludes that each country must have policies in place to spur growth in their rural sectors, to enhance food security and to overcome poverty. The successes and policy lessons learnt point to several major challenges. First, a sustained increase in agricultural pro productivity is required, especially amongst small landholders, with a focus on the youth, women and other disadvantaged social groups and indigenous peoples. Second, food price volatility other market risks and natural disasters, as we've seen recently, can play havoc with, havoc with the well-being of uh, people who live in rural settings. Policies that mitigate such risks and enable the vulnerable to cope with these tragedies deserve very careful uh, scrutiny and construction. Third, the integration of small landholders into high-value chains calls for roles for national government in laying down food safety standards and producers associations that can admit them. And finally, the fourth point in the report is that climate change, on a longer time scale, I admit, poses grave threats to human well-being um, on, the, on the time scale of, of decades. I was reflecting when I was looking through the notes for today that yesterday we had Michael Mahmood speaking about um, the social determinants of health and one could get quite depressed <laughs> with the sorts of talks that we're having at ANU uh, this week about the various problems that uh, humanity is facing. But I do think it's important that universities have these discussions. Uh, they provide a venue where we can, in fact, come to understand the problems and, even more importantly, uh, start to uh, identify procedures that might lead to solutions. It's, it's really uh, wonderful that we can have the present president of IFAD here today to explain in detail the findings and, report and, and policy implications of the report. And uh, it's with great pleasure that I invite Mr Nwanze to address us. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, um, Professor Cram, Lawrence Cram. Uh, it's, it's my great pleasure to be here today uh, at um, a ANU. And first of all, I want to thank you very much for given me this opportunity to present to you uh, a flagship public, pu publication of uh, IFAD, the Rural Poverty Report 2011. Uh, the Australian National University has a global rep reputation as a leader in research and teaching as well. It's well justified. And IFAD has enjoyed a long and I believe mutually beneficial relationship with the university over uh, the years. Uh, allow me to recognize in, uh, uh, amongst the audience um, 
a very good friend of mine, and my former boss, Jim Ryan, uh, when he was Director General of ICRISAT. So while I thank uh, Professor Crown for inviting me to speak, and Professor Ya for who will be taking the floor later, as well as the staff at the Australia South Asia Research Center, who have done so much to make this visit possible. Uh, while I sympathize with you that um, you seem to be getting the reputation of uh, having discussions and conversations on what may appear to be rather sad, uh, the rather sad situation in our, in, in our world today, our publication does indicate that there's a way out of it and the tremendous opportunities and that the challenges can be transformed into great opportunities. So I do look forward to a well-informed discussion today. Australia has strong technical institutions and policy analysis in agriculture and rural development. Not only that it's of relevance to the Asia Pacific region, but to other parts of the world, particularly the semi-arid tropics. I know that there are many in the audience today who are well versed in these areas, such as Jim Ryan, as well as in areas where we face challenges in development such as the management of fresh water resources. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with the International Fund for Agricultural Development, IFAD, let me quickly introduce my institution. IFAD is one of the Rome-based United Nations Food and Agricultural Agencies, uh, the other two being the FAO and the World Food Program, WFP. Uh, IFAD is distinct in its focus, which is and has, has always been poor people who live in the rural areas of developing countries. IFAD is also unique. It is an international financing institution whose core business is providing high, uh, low interest uh, uh, loans and grants to governments. It also is a specialized agency of the United Nations. Partnership has always been at the core of IFAD's business. Actually, IFAD may be described as a partnership institution. It was created as a result of partnerships between the OPEC countries, the OECD countries, and developing countries in 1977. And all the projects that we support are actually implemented by governments and national institutions. IFAD does not have any projects or programs. IFAD supports programs and projects of governments and institutions. We work in collaboration and we work as a facilitator, helping to build a broad response to the key issues facing smallholders and poor rural people and mobilizing co-financing for rural development programs. Since 1978, IFAD has invested more than 12.5 billion US dollars in grants and low interest loans to developing countries. Uh, the projects we support are designed to empower poor rural people to lift themselves out of subsistence and into the marketplace. Uh, to date, we believe we have reached close to 400 million people, actually exactly 370 million. While we are proud of IFAD's successes, extreme poverty and hunger continue to plague humanity. There are some 1.4 billion women, men, and children who are still struggling to survive on $1.25 a day. And despite growing urbanization, entrenched poverty remains very much a rural problem. Today, about 70% of the world's poorest people still live in the rural areas of developing countries, and most of these depend on agriculture for their livelihoods. The two regions worst affected by rural poverty and hunger are sub-Saharan Africa, which is the only region where the absolute number of extremely poor people is still rising, and the South Asian subcontinent, which is home to about 500 million or half of the world's extremely poor people. 
At a time when budgets are tight, when governments need to think carefully about how they spend their money at home, Australia is certainly a good case, as we discussed today. Never mind abroad, you may ask why rural development should be a priority. The answer for us at IFAD is that relatively small investments in rural development today will reap much larger savings in terms of economic, social, and political benefits tomorrow. The development of rural areas is central to eliminating poverty, to mitigating climate change, and to achieving widespread economic growth, security, social, and political stability, and to promoting peace. And it is, of course, at the heart of efforts to ensure long-term food security. And one factor that is often ignored is that improved rural livelihoods reduces urban population bulge, stems internal migration, as well as human trafficking. Historically, agriculture has driven economic performance from 18th century England to Brazil, China, and today Vietnam. And many studies have shown that growth generated by agriculture is two to four times more effective in reducing poverty as growth in other areas, in other sectors. Let's look at some statistics. The share of aid to agriculture started to decline in the mid-1980s. It reached a low of 5.5% in 2003-2005. The World Bank's lending to agriculture also fell from a high of 30% in the 80s to 7% by mid-2000. Governments in Africa, Asia, Latin America decreased their investment in agriculture from as high in some countries as 25% to as low as 3.5% in Asia, 4.5% in Africa. This low level of investment was one of the contributing factors to the global food security crisis of 2007-2008. Of course, there were other structural issues connected with that crisis. And consequently, in 2009, we achieved what has never been achieved by mankind in history. We hit a one billion high of poor, hungry people globally. Yes, that figure has dropped to about 940 million, but that is still shameful if in a world of plenty, over 900 million people still go to bed hungry. Now, since this crisis, there has been renewed commitment by the OECD countries and international financing institutions to agriculture. So agriculture is back at the top of the agenda of development. This is a promising sign, but we ask ourselves the question, did we have to wait for a crisis to stimulate our social conscience? We should learn from mistakes of the past, maintain our commitment to investing in developing country agriculture, and we have to be accountable when we make promises, because promises generate hope and expectations. Food prices are once again at worrying levels, promoting concern about food security. In many parts of the world, people hold governments accountable for ensuring that food is affordable. The desire for food security at the household level is an element of many of the movements for political change today. This is a fact, and it is a particularly urgent and pressing reality in developing countries. We must reverse the neglect that has plagued agricultural development for more than 25 years. <clears throat> so what is new about IFAD's Rural Poverty Report? In 2009, we embarked on, developing, uh, on producing a document on, this, on the current state of rural poverty, working with policymakers, researchers, NGOs, producer organizations, private sector, and poor rural people themselves and their communities. And the result is IFAD's 2011 Rural Poverty Report. 
And what is actually distinct from this report is that we started working on it much after the WDR, World Development Report of the World Bank of 2008, which did not capture, of course, the potential at that time of a severe food crisis. The report is a comprehensive and up-to-date assessment of the challenges and solutions to eradicating rural poverty in the developing world. It examines the vulnerabilities of poor people that live in rural areas and the many risks they face. It shows how rural development can provide greater food security, greater economic security in the future. So greater food security and greater economic security. It offers concrete suggestions for policies and actions to empower poor rural people to move themselves out of poverty to prosperity and to contribute to achieving these goals. And they can also do this through a transformation of the rural space. The Rural Poverty Report 2011 does more than just analyze numbers. It allows poor rural people to tell their own stories in their own words, sharing their challenges, their hopes, and their aspirations. IFAD has long believed that development can only be effective if it is bottom-up, involving participants as partners in the design and implementation of projects. You've just seen a film about the story of Seraphine and her daughter Maria in rural Madagascar. It is important to hear the voices of Seraphine and Maria because all too often the individuals get lost in the numbers. 1.4 billion people living in poverty. Nearly 1 billion going hungry every day. 2 billion living and working on small farms. It is, it, it is easy to forget that each of these numbers represents a person, a human being like you and I. So when we talk about poverty reduction and food security, we're not talking about theoretical concepts. We are talking about real people in real rural areas, in situations of hardship that need solutions today, not tomorrow. The situation that Seraphine faces is typical of many millions of farmers in the developing world. And the fact that she is a woman is also increasingly typical. When we think of farmers in popular culture, we tend to think only of men. But women make up 43% of the agricultural labor force in developing countries on average. In East and, South, and East and Southeast Asia and in Sub-Saharan Africa, this rises to almost 50% and in some countries as high as 70%. Often, women who farm also have extra chores such as gathering firewood, collecting water, washing clothing, tending children and the elderly. And as a result, they often work 16 hours a day, far longer than most, of the, most, most men. At the same time, in comparison to men, women in rural societies have limited access to land, land tenure, access to credit and equipment, as well as fewer market opportunities than men. And in some societies, they have to take permission from their husbands to have any of these. IFAD has long recognized that there will be no substantial progress in poverty reduction and food security unless we address the limits and limitations that are imposed on women. And the Rural Poverty Report offers a snapshot of a complex and rapidly evolving rural landscape that offers genuine cause for optimism intertwined with significant emerging threats for poor rural people like Seraphine. The new threats come from volatile food prices, erratic agricultural markets, growing insecurity of access to land, degradation of natural resources upon which rural people depend, and the worsening effects and challenges of climate change. The opportunities come from the profound changes that are taking place in agricultural markets. With the world population set to grow, 
to 7 million by the end of this year and 9.1 million by in, 20 year, in 40 years, that is in 2050, there are, simply stated, more mouths to feed. And the growth in urban societies means that there is growing demand for high-value food. As a result, it is estimated that global food production will need to increase by 70% by 2050 to meet demand. And in developing countries, it's expected it should double. It is already starting to create new markets, new economic opportunities in rural areas. The spread of grocery stores or supermarkets, and in addition, markets themselves are extending their reach to become better organized. And the report outlines four major steps to eliminate poverty and hunger. The first of them is managing risk. For a farmer living on $1.25 a day, the ability to take risks on planting a new variety, a new higher yielding seed, specializing rather than diversifying, this is often an unaffordable luxury. Poor people have fewer tools to manage risks. As a result, they cannot take advantage of opportunities that could help them improve their incomes. Sometimes it's a decision between investing in a new variety or buying medication for a sick child or a sick relation. As I mentioned earlier today, the challenges that small farmers have always faced are compounded by a number of factors. The worsening effects of climate change to volatile agricultural markets. Given poor rural people's access to the tools they need to respond to these challenges, and to be able to take risks will provide more opportunities for them to be entrepreneurial, creating the conditions necessary for vibrant rural sectors. The second step is ensuring that the world's 500 million smallholder farmers or farms have equitable access to new and changing marketplaces by treating them first and foremost as businesses. The whole paradigm of looking at poor people or poor small farm, small, smallholders as needing humanitarian assistance has to be debunked. Farmers and farms, irrespective of their size or the scale of their activity, should be considered first and foremost as business and farmers themselves as entrepreneurs. With a change in mindset, we should then be asking ourselves, if these are businesses and small entrepreneurs, why are they not profitable? Food tastes and agricultural markets are changing. In recent years, we have seen rapid growth in the reach of supermarkets, locally and globally, and the development of modern consolidated value chains for agricultural products. Smallholder farmers must have opportunities to become entrepreneurs in these new evolving markets, or the risk becoming marginalized. But at present, their prospects of making higher profits from new marketplaces are often upset by high entry costs. And we also should understand that markets are not necessarily international markets. They could be just half a kilometer away. They could be the next neighbor who offers an opportunity for one, for a farmer to sell more, to produce and be able to sell and to make profits. The commercialization of agriculture, smallholder agriculture, is not necessarily the same as big business. It simply is giving farmers the opportunities to increase production and productivity beyond this level of subsistence, to produce ex extra and surplus to be able to sell in the market and to make economic benefits. Much can be done to help poor rural people realize their business potential. This includes reducing transaction costs, supporting rural producers' organizations, expanding financial services into rural areas, ensuring that small farmers have access to infrastructure, utilities, and modern information systems. Investing in good governance is another key ingredient. These essentially are the strategic framework within the strategic objectives within which IFAD operates. 
The third step is to increase agricultural production sustainably. Increased food production must come without significantly expanding the amount of land dedicated to agriculture. Cutting down forests and woodlands to create more land for farming is not a viable option. This means that higher productivity will be necessary. Take the case of Africa. Although Africa possesses 60% of all available agricultural land yet to be cultivated, African farmers today irrigate, irrigation only covers 5% of the agricultural land. In, uh, in India, it's 40%. The average fertilizer use on African farms is 10 kilograms per hectare. In India, is as high as 190, with an average of 120 kilograms. So Africa, and, and besides, less than 5% of farmers use improved high-yielding seeds. So without even expanding agricultural land in Africa, when you look at the challenge of, prop, of poor productivity in Africa, it is tremendous opportunity. By simply doubling fertilizer use, by simply using improved seeds of maize, of rice, and other, other, other crops, you can triple and quadruple production in Africa. Now, this, in my opinion, is where making new technologies available to farmers is key to transforming agricultural production. And so we believe that there are strong potential to improve productivity in Southern Africa, where the average yield is just 20% of its potential. Higher productivity in a sustainable way is also key to such transformations. But whether it's Africa, Asia, or Latin America, we need to increase yields in an environmentally sustainable way. We can't afford to pollute, diminish the land, or contribute to greenhouse gas emissions. Lessons from the Green Revolution in Asia should be factored in an African Green Revolution. In other words, we must have sustainable intensification. But the challenges in Africa are opportunities for that continent to feed itself, just as it is in South Asia. And this means complementing conventional approaches to increasing productivity with a much stronger focus on soil and water management and overall farm production systems. And this is where you in Australia have a wealth of experience in this area. There is no universal method for sustainable intensification. There are many text textbooks that give you prescriptions on how this should be done. From my experience, sustainable in intensification can only be determined by the local context. The challenge is to develop policies and institutions that can aggregate these local approaches to a massive scale, scaling up. The fourth step is to encourage the growth of non-farm jobs in rural areas. So while we talk about agricultural intensification, investment in agriculture, we do believe and we know that agriculture may not be the only pathway towards sustainable growth and economic transformation. Growth in rural areas will not necessarily depend on farming alone, and that many other types of activities which are part of the value chain can contribute to making rural, com rural communities vibrant, creating even greater opportunities for those in rural and urban areas. To meet the growing needs of a hungry world, agriculture must be a viable and rewarding lifestyle for the large number of people who choose it. In order for agricultural development efforts to be effective, they must recognize and redress the obstacles women face in many developing societies. But increasingly, a life in agriculture will be one of many choices for rural people. This is not a threat to agriculture, but rather a chance to develop a more modern, diversified rural economy. We believe that while agriculture can drive the rural economy and transform it to a more vibrant and economic space, non-farm activities also can drive agriculture. And through the value chain, 
young people can get into the process of, uh, to the, uh, process of, uh, of producing food without they themselves becoming the primary producers. Along the value chain, they can enter into the business of producing food either through improved storage facilities, transformation, adding value to products, to produce, or to marketing. So agriculture does not stop with just producing the food, the crop in the field, but also all, over the value, all through the value chain. What has IFA done in the last 30 years? As I said earlier, we have focused exclusively on reducing poverty in the rural areas of developing countries. Even during the period 1980 to 2005, 2006, when donors and governments turned their attention to other areas. As a result, we at IFAD have an unbroken record of working and advocating for smallholders. We have also reformed in recent years to respond to the changing global development assistance architecture and the changing needs of our membership. We have strengthened our operating model by adopting country program approaches. We have strengthened our country engagement through introduction of policy instruments such as performance-based allocation system for allocating resources to governments, an expansion of our presence on the ground, and the adoption of direct supervision responsibilities. We have also strengthened our targeting and knowledge management processes to ensure that we continue to be an innovative institution able to respond to the ever-changing needs of our target group. We have strengthened our business processes to ensure that our, res our resources are better targeted at the country level where our work is. And we have strengthened our quality assurance and support services to ensure that we achieve sustainable results. Recent independent assessments note that our project outreach is increasing and our results on the ground are strong and improving. There are tangible improvements in the quality and development impact of our work. Our latest figures indicate that the number of poor people benefiting from IFAD supported projects reached 36 million in 2010 and is rising significantly and women constitute half of it. Before I start taking questions from the floor, I would like to leave you with one final thought. We are here today at a university that pr prides itself on equipping Australia's young people with the skills they need to improve their lives and contribute to the nation's future. In the discourse on rural development, we must not overlook the next generation who live and work in rural areas. If you have a chance to look through a copy of this report, you'll find an interview with Williams Novoa Lizardo, who may be forced to look for employment in the city because there are no opportunities for him in his rural home. It is essential that we create vibrant rural economies where young people see a future for themselves. These economies will need to offer a range of economic activities so that smallholders and other poor rural people are able to significantly improve their standard of living so that young people can see a future for themselves in rural areas. <clears throat> and we have to inform governments of the developing world that one of the solutions to resolving the issue of bulging urban cities, urban, urban areas, is investment in the rural space. When the rural space becomes attractive and vibrant for the youth to stay in those areas, we will stem the migration of the unemployed rural youth into urban areas. A world that offers hope for Williams and the millions of young people like him is a world that is better for all of us. It ensures sustainable development, it ensures food security, it ensures social and political stability, which we need today. Thank you very much.
I'm fine. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Nwanzi, for the lucid presentation of a very difficult problem. What I particularly liked was the fact that you, in many ways, kept reminding us that behind the numbers there are people. And I think we all appreciate that. We, we've got some time for questions. My question is, how would it be possible to confront poverty in sub-Saharan Africa in the face of burgeoning population and predatory nations such as China and possibly Australia <laughs> attempting to sequester, sequester farmland for themselves? <clears throat> Very good. <laughs> um, let me let me let me go back 50 years ago. I am not so sure the issue is investing what we call responsible investment or investment in agriculture, foreign, foreign investment in agriculture in Africa or Asia or wherever, or even in Australia where they are buying, Chinese are buying some of your large uh, agricultural uh, enterprises. <laughs> Uh, that's the truth, isn't it? <laughs> uh, but it's, it's, it's a question of how it's been done. And I'll quickly, let's travel across from East Africa to West Africa. Less than 50 years ago, uh, most of the, if not all, the tea plantations in East Africa did not belong to East Africans. But tea today that is produced in Kenya or Tanzania is one of the world's best quality. Uh, those tea plantations provided new infrastructure, facilities, electrification, schools, clinics, and what have you. And both the population and the governments benefited from them. Cocoa plantation in Cote d'Ivoire Forget about what is happening today, but cocoa plantation in Cote d'Ivoire and in Ghana also was not owned by the Ivorians or by the Ghanaians. Or timber, rubber in Liberia. It was actually Firestone that owned the forests or used the forests and planted rubber. But before the civil war in Liberia, Liberia was one of the richest countries in West Africa because of its income from rubber. I will describe those as responsible investments, which generated income for those countries. What I'm saying here is that, <clears throat> unfortunately, the so-called land grab today is not done responsibly. We have a global problem for food security. If it deteriorates to the point where you have civil crisis and countries as governments are destabilized and countries become very fragile because of populations of citizens that are not properly addressed by their governments when it comes to food security. The question is, it's not just simple land grab. Uh, Australia has plenty of land but how much of it is fertile agricultural land? Saudi Arabia has more land than Ethiopia, but it's not fertile and it's water hungry. So it's not just land that has been bought, it's also the natural resources in terms of better soils and available agricultural water for production. The question I'm asking is, is it possible for us to think of the international community, FAO, IFAD, World Bank, UNCTAD, developing policies, guidelines, that will ensure that when countries engage in land deals, they are guided by certain principles, like in mining, for instance, the Kimberley, Kimberley, uh, Kimberley what is it called, Kimberley um, process. process, exactly. It is certainly unacceptable if a country like Ethiopia should be leasing land, thousands of hectares of land, <clears throat> to another country and turns around and asks for food aid because it cannot feed its people. 
or when it deprives its, the, the owners of this land, rural people, from making good use of their, of their land. So it, the, what I'm driving at here is that it's not as simple as day and night or white and black. I would like to look at it as a situation that could have become one, a win-win situation where countries can benefit from investments but set the rules set the rules to ensure that investment, foreign investment, whether it's sovereign or private company investment in these countries, benefit the population, not just the governments, and not just individuals in governments, but the individuals, the people themselves, that are supposed to use that land. <clears throat> so the question is, how do you stem the process to ensure that there's responsible investment in agricultural land in developing countries or in places like Australia? developed countries. Some countries consciously have set policies down, uh, Ukraine is one of them, where they actually invite foreign investors to grow food crops in Ukraine. That is a conscious decision of government. Or uh, in Lao PDR, we were there last uh, October, was it? And where they have a conscious effort to attract, they said not the Chinese, very clearly, not the Chinese. Uh, but they are attracting others, I think Israel, the Israelis, and a couple of others, to invest in agricultural land. And with a, a clear deal on how these investments must be carried out. So I do not have a straight answer to you, because I look at it from a, a rather more balanced approach. And see, if 50 years ago, these so-called investments were to the benefit of countries and their population, why is it today we cannot do the same thing? Both your presentation and in the uh, video beforehand, there was references to um, policy guidelines or changes that IFAB might be recommending in order to enable smaller farmers to produce in a market-based economy and you know, reap the benefits of, of their earnings. And I was wondering if you could outline for us quickly what types of policy recommendations are those. You want to take that? Here's my. Uh, the, the director for, for Asia Pacific, uh, Thomas Erhout, uh, that's one of his subjects, so I think he will give you a better answer. No. <laughs> <laughs> our, our, our policy uh, engagement approach uh, is, um, as we like to say, it's uh, it certainly not based on conditionality. It is about uh, shared analysis of the uh, enabling context for uh, money to be translated in poverty reduction. And uh, for that reason, we allocate resources um, as, a, as a function, taking into account the quality of the institutional and policy framework that is in place in the countries. Um, and that is the basis for our performance based allocation system, which has. Uh, about 12 main uh, criteria which relate to uh, the, um, the quality of the markets, the uh, level at which uh, people are organized, the, the, the social capital that exists, um, whether there are, whether there is a plural, a pluralism of uh, policies and approaches for access to water for agriculture for technology, um, and also where there is an adequate allocation <coughs> of public sector resources to support agriculture, transparency of the allocation of those resources, and, and proper governance of those resources. Um, there are other criteria, uh, also for instance, whether um, the, the institutional and policy framework is conducive to allow the women to play the role that they actually play and also get the returns to the investment that they make. So it is uh, the areas where we focus on policy is the areas that are directly relevant to the modernization of the rural economies, starting with agriculture and driving the diversity. Now, uh, we assess that if, uh, if the score is high, we allocate large amounts of resources and we move with programmatic approaches that support government strategies and government policies simply to implement them. When the scores are low, that means we need to do a lot more work. So there we focus with more limited resources on capacity building and capability development and the 
policy to make it uh, A very concrete example of um, work that we did with uh, a person that many of you know, uh, has a rather very from the uh, University of Berlin, was um, Laos, uh, recently published its um, new agricultural natural resource management uh, policy and strategy. Um, the Ministry of Agriculture has indicated their contribution to Laos's objectives of taking Laos out of um, least developed country status within the next 10-15 uh, years. Uh, and basically uh, highlighted the fact that therefore they needed 8% aggregate growth, but contented itself with 3% growth in the agricultural sector. And some <coughs> calculated how much public sector investment was needed to uh, leverage the, the private sector investment that would come in. And the analytical work we did, which was combined with the capacity building of the agricultural sector, actually, first of all, recommended them that we, that we should try to target the higher level of uh, growth in the agricultural sector, because it is still an agricultural based economy um, that we should shoot for at least 4% growth. These are figures that, as economists, we all know for a long time. Um, and therefore, we need to invest at least to increase investment in agriculture by 15%. And it was um, interesting to see that we managed to convince the MPI, the Ministry of Planning and Investment, to allocate more resources to agriculture. Now, the interesting part was that the planning ministry basically was reluctant to do that in the first place. Uh, and the grounds being that uh, labor productivity in the agricultural sector was low. Therefore, they said, well, let us put more of the investment in the mining and in the energy sector. That will give more resources uh, to reduce poverty. Of course, not necessarily uh, realizing that while Laos might become richer, <coughs> and oceans will really necessarily become richer. But when you do that in agriculture, uh, it does make a difference. So that is the kind of policy engagement that, uh, that we are doing. I just gave the example now on finance, but we could give other examples about, about access to water, access to land, uh, farmers' organizations, uh, women access, uh, and women access. Thanks, thanks, uh, Thomas. <coughs> yeah. um, Dr. Nwanzi, thank you very much for your talk. It's a great presentation, and I look forward to reading this. It's time in all my spare time, yeah, and the academics had a lot of that at all. In your talk, you emphasize investment directly to raising agricultural productivity. And I might read you to the report, I see that that's emphasized in your two as indeed it should be. There is another approach to uh, assisting rural people. And I want to ask you to comment on that, drawing you into a little bit of controversy. Japan, Korea, Taiwan raise the prices of agricultural commodities for the purpose of assisting rural people, through, particularly through trade policy interventions. Now, in our part of the world, Indonesia has done the same thing. Since 2004, Indonesia has banned imports of state of crude rice, having previously been the world's biggest importer of rice. And the Philippines is intervening in agricultural markets with a similar objective. Reduce rural poverty, assist poor farmers by raising agricultural prices. Is that a good idea? Uh, you know, I can turn the question around and ask you whether when the OECD countries spend about $300 billion to subsidize their farmers and thereby have a distortion in world agricultural markets, whether that is also a way of ensuring that farmers in rural areas in OECD countries do not stay in poverty. Uh, <clears throat> now, there is an issue here of governance. It's not a question of whether it's right for Japan, Korea, Indonesia or not to do it. It's one of whether you have the right form of governance, the right political will to uh, uh, guarantee 
your, that farmers you know, are able to make profits. And whether, whether it costs trade distortions and what, do, what does this mean? Uh, <clears throat> if the developing world, that is Africa, South Asia, and parts of Latin America, were able also to, let me use the expression, retaliate with respect to the materials that they export to the north, the raw materials, if they were able to retaliate and, be, and, and in, in such a way that it's not actually a ban, that they raise prices of those commodities to ensure that their farmers, the farmers in the rural areas are able to make economic gains and make it more difficult for trade to be able to prosper. The, the, the simple question here is, are we going to be able to achieve a final uh, uh, resolution on the Doha round of, 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 uh, of discussions or not? And what does this entail? It will entail that countries of the north and countries of the south have to remove the distortions that we have imposed in order to uh, satisfy our own domestic needs. It's not just the Koreas and the, and the Japan and Japanese and Indonesians. It's also North America, Europe, and perhaps Australia as well. How do we actually engage in these discussions so that while there are policies that protect farmers at the same time offers opportunities for trade for others to benefit. I, I, find it, I find it actually very hypocritical when the OECD countries say that uh, the developing countries should not subsidize their farmers. When, as I said, $300 billion subsidies is provided by OECD countries to their farmers. And when uh, the president of Malawi decided to subsidize or provide what we call smart subsidies to, to, to maize growers in Malawi, one of the uh, key development partners walked out of the, of, the, of, the, of the room. But they came back four years later to be the ones to champion fertilizer subsidy in Malawi because it worked. So <clears throat> the issue for me very, is very clear. I think when countries are able to take bold decisions that will benefit not only their own farmers, but also ensure that it does not distort, uh, if you call, wish to call it international trade, international partnerships, uh, eventually we might be able to see a, a level playing field. But until it is done transparently and until we, get, we go to DOA and have everything on the table to ensure that we do not set rules for one uh, uh, for one group of, uh, of, of people and uh, separate, uh, separate rules for others. I, I do not think that we're going to be able to conv convince China and I India or, or Brazil to, to give up their own agricultural policies in order to achieve a uh, lasting solution to Doha round of talks, unless the countries of the north also have something on the table that would benefit uh, those, those emerging economies. So you haven't actually provoked me. I think I I've asked you a question. How do you justify providing 300 plus billion dollars in subsidies? Yeah. <laughs> I wouldn't even attempt to justify that. I agree with you totally that's a bad idea. Okay. It, it has the effect mm -hmm. of lowering international prices of, course. of uh, agricultural commodities. Mm -hmm. Now, the question is the, the poor in developing countries take Indonesia poor in Indonesia. Do they have an interest in higher or lower agricultural prices within Indonesia? That's really the crux of my question. Indonesia's policies raise the price of agricultural products within the station price. That benefits small farmers. Yes. It benefits the big farmers a lot more. And it hurts all net consumers of rice. So it's a question of balance. Whereas raising agricultural productivity does not hurt poor consumers. Raising agricultural prices does. So when we raise agricultural prices as the instrument for assisting poor farmers, there are gamers, small farmers, big farmers, rice millers, like the like, and there are big losers, all poor consumers, many of whom 
reside in rural areas. Mm -hmm. And it's surprising what a proportion of the rural poor are actually net buyers of rice. Of rice. But I agree with you about the European and American subsidies, they're, they're the first. But the uh, question is what policies should the developing countries adopt, whether the OECD countries adopt food trade policies or not? I, I will just give an answer. I don't think there's one policy that we can recommend for the developing countries as a whole. It has to go for each individual country. What commodity are we talking about? And exactly what mechanism we have. <clears throat> um, when countries raise prices of com commodities that benefit farmers, whether small, medium scale, or large farmers, but are able to subsidize the, what you call, subsidize the price for consumers and are able to then plug back, or well, not plug, what's the word for it? Um, I, I, what, I can't, sorry, I'm not, an, I'm not an economist, so I don't, but when, when they're able to raise prices so that it benefits producers, but are able to provide subsidies in terms of prices for consumers, but are able to, in terms of if that commodity is tradable in international markets, are able to profit from the high prices in international markets to be able to plug it back into the economies. That is ideal, but I'm not so sure how many cases we have, except where, as I said, the OECD countries are able to uh, both uh, 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 subsidize the farmers to produce more and keep con consumer prices at a level where they can afford it, because then they gain from the, in the export market. It's, it's, it is debatable. <laughs> we have time for one more question. Uh, you might sort of follow on from my previous question. I mean, to sort of um, get locked into a, a trade war seems to me the wrong approach. The mm -hmm. Europeans be very generous and um, give away all these subsidies in terms of large prices and whatever. Really, what the countries themselves should be doing is saying, well, you know, what's in our own interest? They should be looking at the international issue. And if you follow uh, some of the best uh, agriculture producers in Western Europe, like China and Vietnam, they did all that before they joined the WTO and we talked about the trade. They did it in their own interest. And there's a very good example in Indonesia at the moment. They're trying to achieve beef self sufficiency, having uh, uh, beef self sufficiency. They're spending about $2 billion in uh, credit subsidies that are going to do absolutely nothing. And that was put into research and development, which is Peter was showing some of this research. It's just fallen away completely in Indian Then they're going to get a, a win-win situation, including, including increasing their productivity and their stock sufficiency without just wasting money. So that, you know, I, I, I think just sitting back and saying, well, the Europeans can waste their ability. Forget them, do it in your nothing. You do change yourself. I don't disagree with you. <laughs> I don't disagree with you. I, I don't think I'm trying to justify the fact that in Indonesia, you know, could could could, could uh, uh, increase domestic price of uh, uh, rice to benefit farmers and try to compare what the OECD countries are doing. Not in any case. I basically believe that we're looking at a situation where. Until we get, when it comes to international trade and international discourse on trade, we get to a point where we have to ask ourselves whether we're looking at a situation, a, 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 a problem that is a global problem that needs a global solution. And if we continue to go into these discussions based on our own self-interests for our own countries, there's no one country that can survive there's no one country that can be self-sufficient in food production without dependence on others. I think it's an absolute fallacy. Because self-sufficiency simply means your ability to produce what you can produce and to have the resources to buy what you cannot produce. So somebody else is going to be producing what you cannot produce and you must be able to buy from them. That's what it is. It's not producing everything yourself. That's my simple definition of self-sufficiency. So I think oftentimes we, we, we confuse the whole concept of food self-sufficiency with food security. They're two separate issues. Yeah, I think you misunderstood my question. Oh, well. <laughs> but if you look at um, you know, China and 
chime in a bit now, and they opened up the market, both the imports and exports, and they put out the bad resources mm -hmm. and things they did well. And that's uh, what it should be about. I'm not trying to, uh, as in Australia's case, produce very expensive bananas um, at a very, very large cost to Australian consumers. Well, the, the case of China and Vietnam, we use it a lot, we use it a lot for, for, for Africa because if you look at, the case of, look at the case of Vietnam, 25 years ago, Vietnam was a net importer of rice. And today, Vietnam is one of the top exporters of rice. What it's doing is 60% of the rice producers are smallholders in Vietnam. Investment, yes, but also investment in rural development, creating an interest in rural space and organization of farmers to be able to organize themselves and have access to markets. China is the same thing. Massive investment in, in the rural areas, making it attractive for people also to stay in the rural areas and to stay in farming. Uh, and at the same time, you know, creating opportunities. Uh, so <clears throat> it's a question of which, of which model uh, to use. We, but we believe very, I, I believe from what I have seen in Africa, Asia, and Latin America, governments themselves have to create the opportunities for their farmers. And to, to expect that, you know, to, to, to say to farmers to, to, to increase production and productivity and not to have access to markets, even local markets, never works. It's as simple as that. And it's a very simple process. It's time proven and it works. It's worked in many parts of, of, of Asia and it's beginning to work in parts of Africa. And this is basically what we are talking about. The rural space provides the greatest opportunity for sustainable development and economic growth. Thank you very much. I think we need to, uh, to wrap up now, so it's, um, let me say that as a non-economist, <laughs> I've been absolutely fascinated and I can actually see where the next part of this conversation goes, but um, we won't go there right now. Can I, can I close by inviting Professor Jar, Director, Executive Director of the Australia South Asia Research Centre at ANU, to propose a vote of thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Cram, and um, I would like to add my own welcome to Dr. Navanze, Dr. Elahout, and Ron, and everybody else from uh, IFAD. It's wonderful to see you here, and I'm very pleased that you could spare the time to come and give us a, a, your uh, valuable insight into what is clearly a very fascinating analysis of uh, rural poverty in the world at large, and uh, what agriculture, what role agriculture has in, um, in, uh, in, in, uh, in fighting this poverty. I just wanted to add a couple of points for your consideration, um, which may serve as, as uh, bridges to, to further research in this area. The first one is, I think Peter raised this, raised this point, and it has been raised over and over again, that uh, we are talking about, uh, when you're talking about uh, prices received by farmers, and we say that when the, there's an import ban or some such thing, there is prices received by farmers go up. Now, I think that at least in the case of India, which I know a little bit about, it is, um, it is not exactly right to say, uh, to see a correspondence between a retail price and a, and a farm gate price. There are many steps in between, from the farm gate price to the wholesale price to the Monday price to the, to, the, to the retail price. So if the retail price goes up, doesn't mean that the farmer gets a better price. And I think it's one of, it's, it should be one of uh, the key areas for research to do a, a uh, if, if not a census, but a, but a, but a, but a uh, sample survey of farmers in, in, in particular countries to, to really evaluate them, as, evaluate them as businesses in the sense that you very aptly put it, that these farms, these agricultural holdings are actually businesses and let us treat them as businesses. I completely agree with you. So let us find out what is the actual price that they're getting, what is their act actual cost, in India, you have something called the um, Farm Management Survey and the Bureau of, Industri uh, Bureau of Agricultural Costs and Prices, but that's a very, um, 
Uh, that, that, that report is, uh, has a very long lag. It, it is produced very infrequently, but I think it needs to be done in the developing world at large to really evaluate farms as businesses. As I think you have put, you really hit the nail on the head and you really ca characterize them as that. Now, just as uh, when there is, a, there is a business in, 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 the, in the formal uh, organized economy uh, uh, and that business uh, has, uh, has shortcomings, has some kinds of problems, uh, has, uh, has, uh, has, has uh, retarded access to certain key inputs or facilities and so on and so forth, policymakers and policy advocates and, and uh, politicians get behind measures to improve uh, such access. We need to think about that, uh, about that uh, activity in the agricultural sector for small farms. For example, uh, one of the key areas that we need to think about is access to credit, access to marketing. Uh, again, this is something that I know a little bit about uh, for the Indian economy. I, I don't know so much about Africa. Um, uh, but in the Indian economy, in the 53rd round of the National Sample Survey, uh, which, is, which, did a, which did a major analysis of, uh, of uh, access to credit uh, by Indian farms, found that less than 50% of farms had access to credit, any form of credit, formal or informal. And this is reflected in the All India Debt and Investment Survey reports and so on and so forth. So we need to. So if you, everybody would cry foul if small businesses and and uh, and retail enterprises didn't have access to credit. Nobody does anything like that when farms don't have farms don't have access to credit. Similarly, in the case of Africa, you pointed out if farms don't have access to fertilizers or they don't have access to irrigated uh, land and so on and so forth. So I think this 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 paradigm. This narrative of treating a small farm as a business should be taken to its logical conclusion, or at least well along that path, so that we really understand um, what, is going, what is going on there. <clears throat> That's one point I wanted to make. The second point I wanted to make is, is, that, um, is that I think that um, uh, from my own research into into nutrition and uh, and with some of some, some of it with uh, your colleague Raghav Gaya, uh, we have we have we have to understand uh, we have found out there are that in in the standard narrative uh, uh, about um, hunger uh, there are two things we overlook and which are of great significance. The first one is that we ignore allocation within the household. It's household level data. So we assume that, that within the household, um, each person has, uh, has some kind of shared access. And we don't inquire into the terms on which that sharing, uh, on, uh, that sharing uh, takes place. Now that is terribly important, because different, even if everything is going well, even if it's a very harmonious household. Different people have different needs. A pregnant mother in the last trimester has a critical need for inputs, for, for, for nutrition, which if denied will really mean, have very serious implications for the child that will be born. Children have different needs. Older people have different needs. So I think understanding allocation within the household is, is extremely important. And we should be encouraging people who which, uh, collect uh, people who collect uh, household level data to go into this black box of household allocation and uh, and to provide us with data on that so that we can better target the most susceptible groups. So if we can, if if the current current uh, adult population is not very well nourished, we can make sure that at least the next generation, the children, will be better nourished. So we can we can we can we can target we can target that group. And the second thing about nutrition that I want to say is to, to, uh, and to uh, go beyond calories, simply calories. Uh, pro the other micronutrient, protein, and several micronutrients 
have a very important role to play in the development of the human body and mind. A couple of weeks ago, the, even The Economist had a story on micronutrients, you may have, you may have noticed. So I think that that is, that is terribly important. And linking nutritional outcomes to labor market outcomes if for very poor people is, is, is something that is, that, is, that is extremely crucial because nutritional deprivation can have very serious implications on their performance and their participation in, in labor markets. So I'll close with that. Thank, thank you once again, Professor Cram, for supporting our efforts, and uh, Dr. Nawanze and all of you for coming. Thanks again. Bye-bye.